Okay, welcome everybody to the Showcase webinar series. This is Jonah Hobson. I'm the Marketing Manager at ITI, and we have a great presentation on tap for today. Title, The Known, Unknown, and Unknown Known. So it's a bit different, uh, a different angle, let's say, than we are normally coming from with the uh, technical crane and rigging, and load handling, lift planning topics, um, but it's very applicable still. So I'm excited. We have Bill Rago on. He's a senior consultant for Fluor um, HPI, which is Human Performance Improvement Practitioner. And then Zach Parnell, uh, ITI president, is on the line as well. So we'll start out with just a bit about um, ITI, who we are, um, and it's very. We boiled it down to a simple why statement. ITI exists to serve and learn every day. On the screen there, you can see some of the companies we've been fortunate enough to work with, um, and the globe because really our, our instructors and consultants have been all over the globe, uh, spreading the ITI way. We want to thank our sponsor for this webinar series, Lifting Gear Hire. They rent a lot of the equipment that your companies need. I believe we have a few Lifting Gear Hire folks on the line, so thank you for that. And uh, everybody mark on their calendars. I believe it's late summer. We're going to have Lifting Gear Hire on, along with Hydroslide, um, horizontal load moving piece of equipment, and we're going to talk all about uh, about that subject, so look out for that. To let everybody know about ITI, we can do training uh, at client locations. We have training centers all over North America, and then e-learning options as well. You can group some of the training courses into broader subjects such as rigging training, crane training, lift planning and management, um, and then a certification series that we have through NCCCO. Again, ITI, broken it up into a few divisions. There's training, um, e-learning, uh, bookstore, which is great. There's so many resources in our bookstore. Please check that out. Um, field services or consulting division, and then uh, a webinar like the one you guys are on today. I mentioned Bill Rico. He's our guest today. Um, retired U.S. Navy, former uh, chief engineer of the USS Nimitz. Uh, just a vast amount of experience and and we're very thankful to have Bill on the line. Uh, last thing I'll say, and I'm going to turn it over to Zach here for a second. If you do have questions, please enter them into the question pane. Show your, I have your dashboard up on the screen there. Um, I'll be gathering those as Bill is going, so submit them to me, and then we'll, we'll get them to Bill over the air at the end of his presentation. So I'm going to turn things over to Zach for just a moment. Okay, thanks, Jonah. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I just want to take a moment to announce something pretty exciting. Uh, if you can join, you can see my screen okay? Yep, you're good. Great. Um, everybody, Bill and ITI, we've basically been working behind the scenes for several months now on a HPI curriculum. So a lot of the topics of what Bill's going to be touching on today are going to be packaged into two courses. And when I say we have been working on it, Bill has been working furiously on this curriculum. Um, Essentially what we've done, HPI, which if you haven't been on his first webinar, he did a few months ago, um, it's really about improving and uh, the systemic issues in organizations that uh, flaw them up and, and systemic problems that will create accidents downstream. And Phil, Phil talks about basically latent uh, problems as well as uh, problems that will show up immediately. Uh, and anyhow, we, we basically have, we're going to be hosting these events in Houston this year. We have two runs, of, we call them bundles. So there's a two-day course called the Human Performance Improvement Workshop and another uh, one-day course on HPI Acts Investigation. So like I mentioned, I think the uh, first dates are going to be scheduled in, uh, you can find them on our calendar actually, but in September. So September 6th and uh, September 8th would be the true courses there, and then we'll hold them again in December. And we, Bill and I were just chatting in 2017, it'll be a lot more exciting because we'll have these spread throughout North America and host a lot more of these events, but if you're able to make any of those courses, I really would encourage it. Uh, you'll learn quite a bit about uh, an overview today about uh, what some of the content will look like, but uh, Joan, I'll turn it back over to you so Bill can get rolling. 
All right, great. Thanks, Zach. I just gave the screen over to Bill. I got it. All right. Yep, we okay, can do well, thank you, Zach so. and Jonah. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Bill Rigo, and it, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. I've got probably 30 minutes worth of material to talk to you about, and I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and so if you listened in on the last webinar, we talked about human performance and you know how the latent things can can come back to bite you in the butt and and create situations where accidents can occur. Uh, in this particular investigation, we're going to be looking a little bit more about the things that we know and the things that we don't know. Um, and I, I got the idea for this uh, presentation from a fellow by the name of Donald Rumsfeld, and he, he wrote a book uh, called Knowns and Unknowns. And I didn't read it, but I read the, the prologue to it. And Rumsfeld, uh, and I'll just read this, he says, uh, Reports that say something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because we know there are known knowns, there are things that we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns, and that is to say that we know there are some things that we know that we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. And if one looks throughout the history of our country and other free countries, it is the latter category that tends to be the difficult one. And so that's how he kicks off the book. And Rumsfeld's perspective on knowns and unknowns is he focused during the course of his, his very public life to try to know as much as he could about any particular subject to reduce the universe of the unknowns. But he never forgot that there were always things that he didn't know. And he would work with the staff to, to try to winnow that down. So, What's missing from his discussion, he talks about known knowns of the things that we know we know, the known unknowns, and it's the things that we know we don't know, and the unknown no, unknown unknowns, and it's the things that you don't even know that you don't know. And, and what he doesn't discuss, and this is what I found interesting, was the unknown knowns. So what's that? Well, if you look at the known knowns, it's, you know, in the construction business where most of you all are, it's 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 well analyzed, well analyzed. It's well understood, uh, and it, codes and standards are really clear. And your company policies and procedures and training and all the things that you do, trying to keep your employees in this area of the known knowns, where the risk is well understood. And the area of the known unknowns, it it may be uh, you're working on the boundary of a river and you don't know what's underneath the water but you don't care because you're not going to work there. So you put up barriers to keep you away from the things that you know you don't know. Um, in, in my particular area, working with the uh, Department of Energy major laboratories, uh, the area of the known unknown is the area of science. So scientists actually go into the area of the unknown to research it and study it and hypothesize about it to bring it into the area of the known. And so that's a little bit different when you're looking at safety considerations for scientific researchers. Well, in the area of the unknown unknowns, uh, there's an author by the name of uh, Nassim Taleb who wrote a book called The Black Swan, which I would commend to you. Because the area of the unknown unknown is the black swan area, as he defines it, and he, he says that these events are rare, they're unpredictable, and they're extremely consequential. Um, so he looked at the financial collapse of the world financial market in 2008 as a black swan event. But he also looked at other black swans, and I'll be talking about these later on, so you can figure out were they really black swans or not. And, and Taleb says that the only defenses in this area are resilience. So it's the ability to be able to withstand this type of an event and still continue to function. So if you look at the, uh, oh, in the news today, there was a, there were some articles about the Hulk Hogan lawsuit against Gawker for, you know, airing this uh, tape that 
Hogan found unacceptable. And Gawker has been hit with uh, about $115 million of fines and penalties, plus more, and they may end up going out of business. So this, for them, was a black swan event. Um, the other black swan event that Taleb talks about is the, I know we can all relate to, is the Thanksgiving turkey. So the Thanksgiving turkey, every day is pretty much like the previous one. So he gets up, he eats, he gets bigger, and he goes to sleep, and the next day it's more of the same. And, that, and so the turkey thinks that tomorrow is going to be just like today. Well, that goes for about 180 days, and in about 180 days, the farmer comes and chops off his, his head in preparation for the Thanksgiving Day turkey. And so that's a black swan event for the turkey. And, and that's pretty much how it goes. So to the turkey, it was rare. It had never happened in his life. It was unpredictable. And, and for the turkey, it was extremely consequential. So I, I know you can relate to that. Um, so in the unknown knowns, what's that? And I went and researched this, and there's not a lot of re uh, literature that covers it. And so since there's not a lot of literature, I can pretty much define it the way I want to. And, and my definition is, is that it's the area that you used to know, but you forgot. And the problem with this is, is that um, when you're in that area of the unknown known, you actually think you're in the area of the known known and you don't understand the risk of what's about to happen. So to look at a, at a two by two matrix of this uh, in the area of the known known, it's, you can generally you assume that it's safe. Um, in the area of the unknown, unknown known, it's sort of safe, but you're not really sure, so you stay away from it. In the area of the, of the unknown unknown, that's the black swan event, that's really consequential, um, but you don't know it. But then in the area of the unknown known, it's always safe until it's not. And that's the problem, is that when you're in this area, bad things happen to you, and it's always a surprise when the bad event happens. So I, I want to introduce a model, and I talked about this the last time that I was, I was on the uh, webinar, and this is this concept of drift and accumulation. So at the start of a job, there's things that, that the company thinks um, defines work, and this is your policies, your procedures, your pre-job briefings, the, you know, wh whatever you do on your construction site to define the work. And, and management believes that workers are working a, according to the way that, that they think they do. They're following their procedures, they're following their training, uh, they're doing what, what they should be doing. However, there's this blue line, and the blue line is the work that workers adapt to to achieve success, and it is normally successful. Now, the problem is, is events happen while you're there and and you look and oh there's a gap between what the workers are doing and what management thought was happening and you analyze this accident or event in the context of well they weren't following their procedures they weren't following their training they weren't following the pre-job brief they weren't building it according to the plan so the problem with that is is that we know what they weren't doing but we don't know what they were doing and why it made sense to them at the time. Now, while all that's going on, there are hazards on the job site that are building up and you don't know them. In, a, in any construction project that's working at height, as the, as the building that you're erecting becomes taller and the cranes become taller and the, the loads become more massive as you're lifting them up to height, that hazard is gravity. <clears throat> and so, when the, when the hazard intersects the, uh, the work practice, the event happens, okay? and it, it occurs naturally. But it, um, so we look, and we should be looking at how did the normal work diverge from what we thought it was? And then the final thought I want to leave you with is 
is the only thing that you can manage is that gap between the hazard that's building up and the work as it's actually taking place. And that's where you need to learn what that is and how to manage it. And that's where we're going to end up at the end of this presentation. So let's start with Fukushima Daiichi. So Fukushima Daiichi is a multi-reactor nuclear power plant. Uh, it's on the eastern coast of, uh, of Japan, and it's a couple hundred meter, uh, kilometers away from Tokyo. And uh, they, uh, so they had this earthquake, and it uh, uh, created this huge tsunami in addition to the earthquake. And this is what happened at Fukushima. They, they had major damage to most of their reactors. And uh, they did achieve meltdown in a couple of them. Uh, they had some issues with fuel, spent nuclear fuel that was heating up in their spent fuel pools. And this was a reactor plant that the Japanese government very nearly abandoned uh, because the dose rates were so high and it was endangering workers who needed to be there to pour water on it uh, to keep what was left of the reactors cooled down. So this is a major, major uh, reactor casualty. And it was, if you look at Three Mile Island, uh, where one reactor had a partial meltdown, and Chernobyl, where you had a, a, a reactor that had a full meltdown and an explosion, this was somewhere in between but it was closer to Chernobyl than it was to Three Mile Island, so it was pretty bad. So what happened? Well, they had a, an earthquake that was a nine on the Richter scale and a tsunami that was about 11 meters high. And the, I won't get into all the technical details, but it, it caused core damage to three of the reactors and, and pretty extensive damage to the rest of them. And the, all these nuclear reactors are licensed by their version of the NRC, and their NRC said that um, we're going to establish the license basis as an 8 on the Richter scale earthquake and an 8 meter high tsunami. So that's what they analyzed for, that's what they licensed to, that how, that was, that's what defined their safety posture for the reactor. And that's how they built the reactor. Um, but at that time, so 40 years after the license was established, um, Japanese seismologists were monitoring a fault line off the coast, the eastern coast of Japan, and they believed that a thousand year earthquake was about to occur. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. So the, their prediction was that it was going to be somewhere in the order of a, a nine Richter scale earthquake and and they understood what the outcome of that was in terms of, of a tsunami. So you had some seismologists that were you know, over in one place that were seeing this coming and you had engineers in this nuclear power plant and you also had licensing engineers with their version of the NRC that didn't see this. So how come? You know, and, and we know that the how come was was that they weren't communicating because they didn't have to. And, and so they forgot the basis for their license and they didn't think that they needed to go back and check the bases uh, to see if, they're, if what they were doing was still valid. So if you look on this drift and accumulation um, model, um, you can see that at, at the start of the tsunami and earthquake, this line represents their license with the NRC. Uh, the reality is, is that over time, uh, TEPCO, who was the owner of the Fukushima Daiichi plant, uh, had diverged more and more from what the NRC licensing had based on um, everything that, that their NRC said relative to, to uh, seismic controls and tsunami controls. TEPCO kept coming up with scientific um, studies that suggested that they needed to do nothing. So they were working farther and farther away from the, the NRC basis than they thought. 
um, and, and they were very successful. In fact, the, the TEPCO plants were the most efficient nuclear power plants in Japan, and they, mo they made the most money in generating power of uh, any uh, power utility in Japan. So they were very successful. Um, and so when the event happened, they naturally looked at and, and blamed TEPCO for resisting all the improvements that their version of the NRC suggested. But while all this was happening, the hazard that was building up was there was a, a shifting of the seismic plates uh, off the coast of Japan to, that was unrelieved, um, and it's, it's relieved by a, a huge shift, which then generates these earthquakes and tsunamis. So the seismologists saw the hazard but they didn't connect the dots to connect them to potential harm to nuclear power plants that were situated along the coast. And Fukushima was, was right on the coast. Um, so the event happened. Uh, the, the investigations looked at the departure from the NRC license on the behalf of TEPCO, but they also figured out that TEPCO wasn't managing the gap and they weren't learning from it. Um, so I. I listened to a, a lecture from a, a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a member of the National Academy of Science, a fellow by the name of Naj Mishkati, and he teaches at University of California at Berkeley uh, in engineering, and he went over to study Fukushima um, after the event, and, and what he discovered, um, you know, he, he learned all the things that we know today. But he went and looked at other nuclear power plants that were closer to the earthquake and didn't have the damage that Fukushima Daiichi had. And one of the plants he looked at was the Onagawa reactor that was owned by a, uh, a utility was called Tohoku. And so what he found was, was that the, the safety culture of Tohoku was very different from TEPCO, which owned Fukushima. And, and he looked back to decisions that were made 40 years ago and the differences in those decisions that lay dormant for many, many years until they were challenged by this earthquake. And he said it's much better to study companies like Onagawa and Tohoku than it is to look at the failures of uh, TEPCO and Fukushima. And that's, that's something I want to commend to you is, is that there's things that we can learn about success stories um, that are not immediately obvious, and they certainly weren't in the case of this particular accident. So let me move on to Deepwater Horizon. So this is an accident that occurred in 2010, and uh, British Petroleum was, was uh, drilling a very deep well in the Gulf of Mexico, and it resulted in a fire and explosion. You can see the results of this in the pictures. And so, um, and we've read a lot about this in the papers, and so what essentially happened was, was the Transocean drill rig had finished drilling this, this uh, well. Uh, they were down at about 29,000 feet, um, and they were trying to cement in the rig so that they could bring in another rig to begin pumping oil and natural gas out of this uh, uh, Macondo site where it was, and they lost control of this, this pressure, and they had a a violent um, series of explosions that ended up resulting in the deaths of 11 people. Um, and it released 40 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. And so you know, on all these oil rigs, they've got something called a blowout preventer that you may have read about, and it was the final safety system. So you know, in the event of fire, you, you push this button, and the blowout preventer basically seals in the well, and it failed. And what we now understand was, uh, if you look at deep water drilling in the North Sea, which is kind of where we learned how to do this, um, in events where the, the BOP was activated uh, in, in the event of an emergency, uh, it, it only, it failed five out of 11 tries which is not a very good success rate for something that's your last ditch um, uh, defense. So when they looked at it in hindsight, and of course if you're being looked at by all these government agencies, it's not going to be good for you. 
uh, they had numerous problems with their maintenance, their licensing, oversight, management, supervision, training, um, how they constructed the contract. Because Transocean was owned, um, you know, by the Transocean company, um, or Deepwater Horizon was was owned by the by Transocean, um, and BP was the um, they were the owner of the license to drill at the Macondo site, and then there was another um, company, which is escaping my memory right now, that was responsible for the actual drilling. And, and every one of these companies is pointing fingers at the other, and the government finally said, no, BP, you were responsible for this, and you're the one that's going to pay the price. So if you look at this again, at the start of the job, there was a license uh, to drill, uh, and there were policies and procedures and regulations and what have you. And what they found was on that blue line, uh, British Petroleum was departing farther and farther away from their license basis uh, than the regulator had initially understood. And they were very successful. British Petroleum is a very profitable and successful uh, oil and gas uh, company. So when you looked at the event uh, in the context, it looked really bad for BP, and it was. Um, but the, in the meantime, what was going on was this hazard, which was this high pressure uh, that they were drilling into uh, at, at very deep um, levels in the ocean, was building up and building up and building up, and finally they drilled into it, and then they couldn't contain it. And so where the hazard met the work practice, the event occurred. So the investigation looked a lot at the normal work, but in terms of, of learning about this uh, accident, BP wasn't operating the rig the way that the government thought they were, and in fact the workers on the scene were not operating the rig the way that BP thought they were. So this gap was getting closer and closer together to the point where um, a simple error, and in this particular case the error was in misreading the pressure signals that the rig was, was telling the operators that basically said that the rig was not sealed. And they, they missed that, that signal and they went on and, and attempted to seal in the rig anyway. Uh, to cement it in, and the consequence occurred. So the the next event that I want to talk about is one that we don't know very much about, and we probably never will. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion about this. This is the crane collapse at Mecca uh, in September of last year, and the you had a, a pretty big crawler crane. It was a leap hair crane that in the middle of this huge windstorm and sandstorm that came blowing up out of the Gulf, uh, tipped over backwards and fell onto the Grand Mosque in Mecca, uh, virtually over the, you know, this cube that's in the center of the mosque. Um, and so the, the crane was a, a, a huge crane. I, I'm not familiar with this particular model, but it was a leaf hair crane had a large main boom, had a derrick mast and a luffing jib, that, and, and the, everything extended 200 meters high. Um, it was, at the time of the accident, it was stowed with the mast uh, virtually vertical um, and unloaded, and it had been there for some time. It was, it, in fact, it was rarely used. Uh, and when it tipped over, it resulted in 111 deaths and 300 plus people were injured. Uh, what was notable about this was that uh, the Bin Laden Construction Company, um, yeah, and it's, that's the name that's associated with, with Osama, he's from that family, they were uh, in charge of that particular crane. So they had rented it from another company, but they were responsible for using it. Um, and Bin Laden was one of the largest construction companies in Saudi Arabia. They're one of the best. They make a lot of money. And in order to do work, in Mecca, you've got to be pretty well vetted in order to, to do that type of work. Well, they, they did an accident investigation, and the accident investigation determined 
that the accident was the fault of heavy winds and negligence on the part of bin Laden uh, due to improper stowage of the crane. Now, when you look at that, what was going on at that time? Well, it occurred two weeks before the Hajj, which is the, a major pilgrimage. So every, every Muslim uh, in the modern world is expected to make a pilgrimage to Mecca once in their lifetime. So you, there are millions and millions of people that, that show up in Mecca during the time of the Hajj. Um, and as you might imagine, this is a, a prime time for the Saudi government to show off to all these pilgrims that are coming in from all over the world. Uh, so they're set up to do this. And um, when you, let me go back to the pictures, you can see an awful lot of cranes that were up all around this mosque at the time. So there, it was a major construction site. And then you can see down here at the bottom of the picture, these are pilgrims that are entering the mosque. And so there were co-location issues and there were thousands of people in the mosque at the time of the accident. Um, but you can't necessarily block off you know, the central, you know, the focal point of the of the, Mos the Muslim religion from people who want to get in and worship. So you can expect that this was a, a major construction project, which it was. You can probably expect that they were behind schedule, um, which I think they were. And so there were all sorts of pressures that were being exerted on the, um, the project manager at that construction site for bin Laden. Um, there were at the time about 20 or more luffing jibs that were in operation around the site. There were a, a large number of tower cranes that were uh, working at that site. Uh, and, and in general, um, what you do when, you, when you've got a wind event coming in is you lay the cranes down. Or for the tower cranes, you put them in a, in a weather vane condition where they're going to be moving around with the wind. Um, and, and we also understand that there were several of the tower cranes that had not been weather vaned. So, but it turned out to be a, an okay decision because they didn't fall down. There were luffing jibs, uh, jib cranes around the uh, construction site that had also not been lowered. And they were successful in that they didn't fall down. So you look at the decisions of the project managers that you know didn't put the tower cranes in weather vane position, uh, the project managers that didn't lower their luffing jib cranes to the ground as they should have done, and they were successful. So was their decision better or worse than the project manager for bin Laden that either forgot or, or did not or, or made the conscious decision to not lower that crane to the ground. Because when you do that, that's going to take time, it's going to take money, it's going to take effort, all of which um, in, in that resource limited environment, uh, the project manager for bin Laden may have thought that he didn't have. Um, but it, it resulted in a major embarrassment, both for bin Laden, who's now been banned from uh, doing construction work in Saudi Arabia, and the company officers have been prohibited from uh, leaving the country until the, the king can figure out what to do with them. So th this is a, uh, a major event, but was it predictable? Um, so if you look at, again at, at this particular um, model, you know, at the start of this job, you had construction that was going on, you had a schedule, you had a project, um, you had rules that they had to follow. Uh, but we, we can see, not only for this crane, but for a bunch of other cranes in the area, they were departing from what normal protocols for crane operations would be. And they were successful, um, except for the fact that they may or may not have been behind schedule or over budget. Um, so if you look at the accident that, that occurred, um, you look at, at bin Laden, and they did not lower the crane as they should have done. Um, and they had a bad event. 
Um, but at the time, they had hazards that came up. Um, one of the things that was going on was that the laydown yard was absolutely chock-a-block. So even if bin Laden had made the decision to lower that crane, it was so big and the laydown yard was so crowded, it, it's reasonable that they may not have had time to get that boom down before the winds came. And when these winds come up, it's, it's unpredictable and they, uh, it, it's hard to do something about it before they're on you. Um, so the hazard was the winds and, and the event happened and it was extremely consequential because the winds were stronger than they thought, the sand was coming up and that was the time of year that sandstorms do come up and they had a large number of pilgrims in the mosque at the time of the event. Had this occurred at night, it would not have had the consequence that it did. Um, so we, we study the you know what was going on. Uh, you look at the departure from what the government thought was going on, and that's what led to their finding of negligence on the part of, of Bin Laden. But at the time of the event, the construction manager or the project manager for that project uh, made a decision that had probably been successful for him many year, many times before, and and may have except for all the variables. Um, and what we learned was was that the Bin Laden Construction Company and, and most of the other construction companies there on the site were not learning about what was going on uh, between their normal work practices and the hazards that were building up at the site. So, so what's the point? Um, and the point, I think, for all of us is what can we learn from this so that we can do something differently because, you know, in the project world, the construction world, these things happen, um, but what can we do to avoid these types of accidents? And so what I offer up to you is another model. It's kind of like the previous one on drift and accumulation, but it's what I call a resilience model where um, if, you, if you look at this, you, you see um, you're going to see here where as managers see what's going on and you see a departure from what you expect, they're going to exert leadership intervention to get the practices back up to what they think. Um, at the same time, they're looking at what's going on in terms of the hazards that we know about. Are they building up? What can we do um, to, to manage those, to keep those below an acceptable risk line? And so what you're doing is you're managing resilience, and resilience is the gap between your actual work practice and your actual hazard. And so it all involves leadership in getting out in the field, looking at what your hazards are, and most importantly, seeing what the workforce is actually doing and what, how they are adapting to their environment in order to be successful, because they're going to be successful one way or another. And so what can we as, as managers and leaders within our companies do to do that? And my point is, is, is understand what's going on at the, at the work face where the, where the workforce is physically touching the construction project, number one. And then number two, getting out there and trying to figure out, <coughs> excuse me, um, what kind of hazards am I dealing with? so that I can manage them, recognizing that all these things are variable. And that's really, really hard. Um, and when I go out in the workforce and I go to the work face and I talk to workers, I, I ask them, what are you doing? And how do you do this? And, and, and they think I'm not very bright, but you know, I, I ask all these how questions and what questions. I don't ask why questions. And I'm just trying to get a feel for what kind of problems go on at the job site that I'm just not aware of. Because my role as a manager or as a leader is, is to provide the resources so that my employees or my workers can be successful. And, and this is policies, procedures, it's tools, it's materials, all these things. What can I do so that the moment that my employee physically touches the, the company, whether it's a crane or a front loader or a track hoe or you know, even operating a nuclear power plant, 
how do I know realistically that the outcome of that touch is going to be successful? So these are all things that as managers and leaders in your respective companies, you should be thinking about as well. And I would challenge you to go out today or tomorrow into your company where workers are phys doing physical work and ask them those questions. You know, what are you doing? How do you do it? Um, what are the challenges that are presented to you when you get this job done? How does the procedure work, work for you? Uh, do you have enough tools? Um, what can I do to help you? Um, these are all questions that you should be asking. So the, how do you move from hindsight, you know, which is where we've been, we've been focusing on three events, and looking at how they drifted into failure, I, how can you turn that hindsight into foresight? Well, I've got four things that I would commend to you. One is, I think reducing errors uh, is one of the tools that, that you can have. So presenting things clearly to workers, uh, to you know, workers who are at the work face, uh, is important so that you can, you can reduce the consequential errors that they make. I think, as I said before, you need to monitor their work practices, you know, to narrow that gap between work is imagined and work is done. Um, you should do things to make your hidden hazards more visible. So one of the things I commend to people is housekeeping. Um, so when you are doing housekeeping, you make it easy to see what's wrong. And, and you're making the workplace more transparent. Um, the other thing, I, and the last thing that I would commend to you is to utilize learning teams to learn not only from failures but from successes so that you can kind of understand what's going on deeper within my company that I don't know. And have I drifted into that area of the unknown known? So am I assuming things that perhaps I shouldn't? So when you founded the company or you started work with the company, there's things that you learned about the company, and you may have drifted away from those initial concepts that you thought you knew and forgotten them. So these are four things I would commend to you. So um, that's what I wanted to give you. If you want to learn more about HPI, um, go to this website, iti.com slash Houston. Um, we're going to be doing classes uh, September the 6th to the 8th, a two-day class on human performance and then a one-day class on human performance investigations, uh, both in September and uh, December. And I'm excited to be uh, teaching those. And you can either get a hold of, of Zach or Jonah or, or me, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. So at this point, I'm done. And Jonah, I'm going to turn it back to you for questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, as Bill mentioned, we're going to be holding two sessions of those three-day courses at our training center in Houston. Um, the website he mentioned, iti.com slash Houston, will actually have all of the Houston dates. So in addition to HPI, um, Zach did pull up those course pages at the beginning. So if you want to learn a little bit more, there's a nice course description, some learning objectives um, and, and those and, and as Bill mentioned again please if you have any questions reach out to me Jonah at ITI.com um, Zach or Bill so I I'm not seeing any questions right now a couple came in but um, they kind of answered their own question or, or it was something that you uncovered later in the in the program Bill so okay. um, I'll leave it open a bit longer, but uh, unless something comes in in the next couple minutes here, then uh, we can sign off. Let me take control of the screen back very briefly, just for folks who are um, who are with us right now. Just to, to mention the next webinar coming up, um, we will have the global head of safety, health, environment and quality control from Amut, Sheldon Redpath on, um, and it's, it's interesting, it's a bit of a pilot um, program for the, the new ICAB, International Competency Assessment Board, assessment when it comes to cranes and rigging.
So that should be uh, should be interesting, and we're looking forward to that one. The date on that is April 6th, and registration is open for that. Um, I'm still not seeing any questions, so uh, I think with that we will wrap things up. As always, we're recording this session. We'll try to post the recording. Well, we, we will post the recording within 24 hours, so look for that. I'll send a link to the recording to everybody who is on the line now and those who registered but weren't able to make it live. So uh, I, lastly, I want to thank Bill one more time. Uh, I can speak for all of ITI, I think, pretty safely on this and saying, Bill, it's great to work with you um, on projects like this webinar as well as the courses coming up. And yeah, we're, we're looking forward to that. It's something, as I said, it's a different angle than the uh, really technical meat and potatoes that you're used to from us, but it is very applicable to every kind of crane rigging, load handling, lift planning um, situation that we find ourselves in regularly on the job. So thank you again, Bill. Thank you guys for attending today. Um, I hope you Thanks. enjoy the rest of the week. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Um, and it, again, if you have any questions about this webinar, um, anything ITI related, please reach out to me via email, Jonah, J-O-N-A-H, at ITI.com. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, we'll catch you next time.